Good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here today. What have you been wondering today? Maybe you have wondered how on earth those huge ships float. Or maybe you have been wondering how these amazingly tall buildings can stay up in a heavy wind. No matter what you have been wondering, I hope you have wondered something. Because an ability to wonder and ask questions are prerequisites for lifelong learning. As it was said, I, I'm a researcher at the University of Helsinki, and I'm especially interested in, in early science education. So how we can introduce science for young children through play and playfulness. In addition to my researcher position, I'm also the founder of Gide Science. Gide Science is a company that is delivering all over the world playful science education uh, as a hobby or as a content for kindergartens. Children are the masters of wandering. How many stripes do zebra have? Could all the ants in a world lift up all the people on the earth? Why sun is yellow? Children ask questions every day, and if we believe the research, children ask on average three questions in every two minutes. That's quite many questions per day. And then we have those most important questions, which are what if questions. What if Earth was not flat? What if human could fly? What if questions are the most important questions because those are the questions that change our world? And one what if question that is affecting very highly in our, our daily life nowadays was posed 50 years ago. And that what if question was posed by Martin Cooper as he was walking down the street and he asked, what if I could make a phone call while I'm work walking here? And that what if question was the question that led to the development of mobile phones. Children are the masters of wandering, but we have a very concerning trend happening when children gr grow up. Because, a little exaggerated, children stop asking questions when they enter the school. And those questions are so important because if we can, if we can have this curiosity towards scientific phenomena we have in our everyday life, we can have effective science education going on. So we really would want children to keep up asking questions. But how can we do that? We know that very many of children's questions they ask concern the scientific phenomena we have in our daily life. Where does the rain come from? How does the rainbow, uh, how does rainbow come? And that kind of questions. But if we look at the research, uh, kindergarten teachers don't feel confident to handle science-related uh, science themes with young children. And if we have this situation, that some of children's questions, those science-related ones, are not answered, answered by taking them as a starting point for our learning in kindergartens. We, as an adult, define what children are allowed to wonder. Ch 
children benefit early science education from many points of view. Early science education can help children to learn skills, how to find out. So those kind of very fundamental skills you need throughout your life in every single field of science. But through uh, natural sciences, that kind of skills can be most effectively learned. If we start science education early, we can develop positive attitudes towards science. And those positive attitudes are highly important because if we have positive attitudes towards science, we have interest towards science, then more likely we are able to learn science also in more advanced levels when we need to work more hard to learn uh, scientific concepts. And third one, children benefit very much if they gain scientific vocabulary in their early years. It's much easier to learn advanced level science if you already have that scientific vocabulary uh, once you are are going to learn those more abstract level knowledge about science. So you need to have the vocabulary that is connected to everyday life uh, contexts where you can see that science happening in your life. And why science education in general level is very important. We are living in our society now very special times, and we are living special times uh, from the two points of view. One, nowadays we have basically all the possible knowledge we have in our world. It's possible to gain that knowledge through your cell phones. And as you have all the knowledge gainable through cell phones, through internet. There is also the threat that anyone can publish anything online. So nowadays we need more critical thinking skills than ever in humankind history. All the time we are browsing through the web, we are browsing through our social media feeds, we need to think critically. Is this piece of information trustworthy? Who has published this? And what are the intentions of this publisher? Second reason why we are living very special times at this moment is that never before in humankind history we haven't had this much carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Never before we haven't had that much plastic in our oceans that it compares to a size of a continent. Never before we haven't been in the situation that soon we have 10 billion people here on the earth and we don't have technologies to guarantee pure, pure water for everyone. So we are living the situation. We are having those, as Professor Longa also referred, those wicked problems that need to be solved so that we will have humankind on the earth after 2,000 years. And to solve those wicked problems, we need more science-related knowledge. We, we need people who have ability to cooperate, who have creativity, and who have this willing, positive attitudes to use science to guarantee that we have humans on Earth also after a couple hundred years. When we are starting to design science education, we have to consider three fundamental questions we have. 
First one is, we should ask ourselves, what is science? Second one, what young children should learn about science? And third one, how young children learn. And if we take a look first of the question, what science is? We can define science as scientific knowledge. The knowledge that scientific research is producing. For example, water boils in 100 degrees and a rainbow is formed when a water droplet acts as a prism and um, makes the white light shatter into the all color spectrum. It's very common that this scientific knowledge is understood as science. But science holds also the idea how we produce scientific knowledge, the process behind scientific research. And the third one is how we utilize science in our everyday life and how we make sure that scientific knowledge is used for decision making. I have those papaya pictures there just to represent the idea that in, in Hawaii there was made some um, experiments with papayas to prevent a disease that was making all the papayas ruined, but uh, later uh, that kind of Manipulating papaya's uh, system was denied uh, against the fact that it would have helped to get those papayas for markets. Then, when we look at the second question, what children should learn about science? Children should gain scientific literacy. And with scientific literacy, I mean ability to understand where science affects in our lives, skills to take part in conversations that concern science, to use scientific knowledge in our everyday life decisions and in decisions if we are doing those in societal level. We can look science from three different representational points of view. We have science in macro level. And with that I mean all the scientific phenomena we can see and we can sense through our senses. For example, when you are adding salt to the water, you can see in a macro level that once you stir it, the salt will disappear. That same phenomena can be represented in a micro level. And we can draw models what will happen to salt, natrium chloride, when we add it to the water and represent it in a pictural way. Then we have our symbolic level. All the names and all the symbols we give to understand science. So here is an equation about what happens when salt dissolves into the water. We can compare learning of science to learning of driving a bicycle. Here we have a picture of kick bike. What you need to be able to drive a bicycle? You need pedals, you need steering, and you need balance, right? And the magic of kick bikes is that we take away one of those three factors you need in driving a bike. And we have balance and steering. 
And once children first learn this balance part and steering part, they will very easily gain that pedaling part once it is added. We can do that exactly the same thing for science education as well. In young children's science education, we can first pay attention to macro-level phenomena. Phenomena that children can, uh, can study, can experiment with their senses. And then we can concentrate on symbolic level of science. The scientific vocabulary names that we give those phenomena. And we can leave away for a while that micro level of science that requires quite high level of abstract thinking. And once children first are able to, uh, able to learn science through macro level and symbolic level, we can assume that it's easier for them to learn that abstract level when it comes a bit later. Young children, if we look at the research, should learn science process skills as a result of their early science education. Those basic level skills, making observations, inferring our observations, where, why we do observe something, um, classifying, making predictions, communicating, those skills are the ones that benefit children later in all fields of education. We, we should not concentrate on delivering the facts for children when they are young. We should concentrate on training these science process skills in hands-on activities. And those activities should be ones that are based on everyday scientific phenomena that children find meaningful for themselves. And then we have the last fundamental question about young children's science education design, and it is how children learn. Learning is a social and cultural process. To be able to learn, we need an, another people. We need interaction. And learning is constructive process. We need a base to start building the new knowledge on. And if we look at the learning, the picture at the top is representing the scaffolding. Here, if we are learning to ski, we need certain tools for to be able to ski. So, the skis. And we need someone to model you first how to do that skiing. In that picture, there an adult is holding a child between his or her legs. So, an adult is scaffolding children very actively for the first steps when they are training the skiing. And once the child gets more experienced, they can release the level of scaffolding. And that exactly the same thing should occur when we look at earlier science education. First, children need high level of scaffolding from adults, from peers. And once children get more skillful, we can release the level of scaffolding. Earliest science education should be hands-on, so that children can experience that learning through their multiple senses, so that it is multimodal. They can use their hands, they can use their whole body to engage in that learning process. And the third one, children should have experiences from their daily life 
to connect that new knowledge about science. So it's highly important when we are looking at early science education that we bring to children's minds their earlier experiences about the topic. But also it is important that we look to the future. When is the next time when children will face this same scientific phenomena in their daily life and build bridges into children's experiences? Children learn through play. Children learn very basic uh, everyday actions through playing with them, how to shop, for example. Children learn social skills through playing. But children also can learn science through playing. We can use play as a starting point for science education. So, for example, uh, one teacher told me once that she was outside with the kids. And there was a mud puddle outside. And one child had new mittens, nice pink new mittens. And that child was dipping the tip of a mitten to that model pool. And the teacher told me that she was just about to run to the child and make her stop. Like, stop, don't put your mitten into that mud puddle. But then she decided that she won't say anything. She just went to the child and started observing what child was, to, was doing. And then she asked from, from a child, what are you doing? And the child answered, can you see? Once I dip just the tip of the mitten into the mud pool, the water, anyway, rises up the mitten. And that was a starting point when they started to learn more about capillary effects. So we can, we can make careful observations about children's play and pick up the topics when they are paying attention to some scientific phenomenon. And through that, learning those science process skills and scientific vocabulary. Stories and fairy tales are excellent way to bring back children's memories about scientific phenomena and how they feel in everyday lives. We can also see science as a play. And for example, in Kides Science, we arrange our science classes so that those are one big role play of science. And that means when children are putting their lab coats on and their goggles on, they will take a role of a real scientist. And we have those rules for science play. And those rules are what scientists are allowed to do. They are allowed to make observations. They are allowed to infer. They are allowed to ask questions, to share what they have learned. And through engaging this kind of science play, children will learn uh, about scientific thinking processes. I have a very quick video showing you how does it look like when children are doing this science play.
Thanks. And we have created also that digital form of science play so that we can bring science education, playful, fun science education also to homes. And one of the most important uh, aspects of playful approaches to science, we shouldn't forget the importance of free play with science, so that we give children opportunities to play with scientific phenomena. For example, with flashlights, with magnifying glasses, and to build their understanding also uh, in those moments when nobody is telling what you should do, but you can try out all possible things that you make up and use your creativity to use these scientific phenomena for your play. Do you want to know what I have been wondering lately? I have an eight-year-old son, and he's watching a lot of videos from the YouTube where someone is playing video games. He looks at videos when someone is playing, for example, Minecraft or Fortnite, and I was nagging at him one day and asking, why, you, why do you watch someone playing on your screen? Why don't you just play by yourself? And he was looking at me like all the eight years old boys look at their mothers and said, Mom, you're watching football from the television. Why don't you just play it by yourself? And that was the moment when what-if question started to go around my head. And that what-if question is, what if adults played more? Thank you. <laughs>